sentencing in the state of Ohio versus Jeffrey Scullin Jr. This is case 622-929. The defendant, Mr. Scullin, is present in the courtroom with his counsel, Mr. Joseph Pettitus, representing the interests of the state of Ohio are Assistant County Prosecutors Andrew Santoli, Chris Schroeder, and Hannah Smith. On October 17, 2018, the defendant pled no contest to and the court found the defendant guilty of the following offenses. Count one, aggravated murder in violation of section 2903.01A, an unspecified felony, and the one year and three year firearm specifications there under. Count two, murder in violation of section 2903.02B, also an unspecified felony, and the one year and three year firearm specifications there under. Count three, felonious assault in violation of section 2903.11A1, and also the one year and three year firearm specifications under that count. That's a felony of the second degree. Also count four, felonious assault in violation of section 2903.11A2, a felony of the second degree, and the one year and three year firearm specifications there under. Count five, tampering with evidence in violation of section 2921.12A1, a felony of the third degree. Count six, making false alarms in violation of section 2917.32A3, a misdemeanor of the first degree. And count seven, endangering children in violation of section 2919.22A, a misdemeanor of the first degree. With regard to the issue of merger, Mr. Schroeder, are you going to speak to that issue as to what counts merge for purposes of sentencing and which count then the state will have this court elect or have, has this court a sentence, Mr. Scullin, on? Yes, Your Honor. For purposes of sentencing, the state will stipulate that the following counts will all merge into a single offense. Count one, aggravated murder. Count two, murder B. Count three, felonious assault and count four, felonious assault. The remaining counts, five, six, and seven, will not merge. And of the four counts that do merge, the state will elect to proceed to sentencing on count one, aggravated murder. And you would agree as well that the uh, firearm specifications merge as well under Correct. count one? Correct, Your Honor, yes. All right, thank you. Mr. Patitus? I have no objection to that, Your Honor. All right. Then the court will sentence Mr. Sullen on count one, aggravated murder, and the three-year firearm specification there under. Uh, with regard to count five, which is not merged, that's tampering with evidence, that is a felony of the third degree. This particular felony of the third degree is punishable by a prison term of 9, 12, 18, 24, 30, or 36 months, a fine of up to $10,000. There's no presumption in favor of or against prison for a felony of the third degree, but if prison's imposed, there is a discretionary period of post-release control of up to three years. A misdemeanor of the first degree, those are counts six and seven, are punishable by a period of local incarceration of up to 180 days and a fine of up to $1,000. Any time imposed on those two misdemeanor offenses must be served concurrently with time imposed for the felony offenses. With regard to count one, aggravated murder, 
that the state has elected this court sentence you on, Mr. Scullin. There are four potential penalties for aggravated murder under Ohio law. The first is life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 20 years. The second is life imprisonment with the uh, possibility of parole after 25 years. The third is life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. And finally, uh, the fourth option is life in prison with no possibility of parole. Also, the court has discretion to impose a fine uh, for up to 20, is it $20,000, Mr. Schroeder? Yes, Your Honor. And um, so in that regard, is there anything, or what would you like to say on behalf of your client, Mr. Kattachus? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. On behalf of Mr. Scullin, uh, first, uh, I know the court has before the pre-sentence investigation report. I find no uh, no errors in that report. I think it's important to note, as I know the court has reviewed it, but for the purposes of the record, my client's 21 years old. He has absolutely no prior criminal history. Uh, and in this matter, he spared both the state, uh, and the government, and the, the victim's family the need for a trial by entering his plea. Uh, he, he is... Um, Obviously, he has legal options that he may still explore, but that is something I believe the court should take into consideration. Rather than making this a long, drawn-out four-week process, we're, we're sparing that and taking that into account. Uh, I do want the court uh, to consider that this is, whatever the court sentence that you hand down, Your Honor, this is going to be a life sentence. Um, and we have the range we talked about previously. We have the parole board in place for, for a reason. And I, I think that it's important that we trust the parole board. You know, 28 years down the line, I, I have no idea what type of individual this will be, but he will be in prison for at least, if the court was to sentence to life in prison with a possibility of parole after 28 years, that's 28 long years. And almost nobody gets out at the first parole board. In fact, I, I cannot find a case where somebody was released at their first parole eligibility. Um, so when I say trust the parole board, uh, it is a life sentence, but let's leave some hope for remediation in the future. Um, he does have sentencing factors that mitigate and, and depart downwards towards the minimum. When I say minimum, it's not truly the minimum. The minimum would be here, the 20 uh, plus the three years. That would be truly the minimum. So we are coming in uh, substantially higher than the minimum, regardless of what side of the range the court sentence is on. And when I say trust the parole board, a sentence of life with parole eligibility at 36 years, I mean, we're talking 50 years down the road before he possibly gets out. Uh, and I think with somebody of this age, no prior record, uh, his educational, he's on the, the low end of the educational spectrum. He completed the 10th grade successfully, he completed no grade beyond that. Uh, Your Honor, it's appropriate in this case, I think, for the sentence of uh, life in prison with parole at 28 years. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Scullin, what would you like to say on your own behalf? Okay. All right. And Mr. Patichus, uh you agree that the three-year firearm specification mandates that the court impose a three, the three years prior to and consecutive to any time imposed on the underlying offense, correct? Absolutely, Your Honor. All right, thank you. All right, who would like to speak on behalf of the state of Ohio? Your Honor, maybe. Yes, yes you may speak. Please be seated. Very briefly, Your Honor, I misspoke a moment ago. It's actually a maximum fine of twenty-five. Five thousand. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Just to clarify that, for this particular aggravated murder. Um, conviction, the fine is up to $25,000 as distinguished from $20,000. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I have some brief comments for the court. Just outline some of the evidence uh, that would have been introduced if the case had gone to trial. Uh, and as this court is well aware, lots of family members and friends of Melinda's are in this courtroom. Uh, several of them are going to address the court uh, after my brief comments. Uh, Bruce Puskovic and then both of Bruce and Melinda's daughters, uh, Anna and May, are also going to address the court to let you know um, the loss that they have suffered uh, from this defendant uh, a year ago. And I know this court is also well aware of, of the outpouring of letters and support that this court has received since the sentencing. And I know you had an opportunity to review those uh, prior to the sentencing today as well. Uh, Your Honor, as you've already outlined, uh, the state of Ohio versus Jeffrey Scullin, uh, we went over the indictment briefly, and the state uh, did agree, did stipulate that this defendant, uh, for all the no contest pleas, can only be sentenced uh, on two charges. It's the aggravated murder charge with three year firearm specification uh, and the tampering with evidence charge that you just went over. Your Honor, uh, as the court is well aware, uh, in order to run consecutive sentences, 
this court must make certain findings under revised code section 29.14c4 29, that if you are going to impose multiple prison terms uh, on the offender for convictions of multiple offenses, the court may require the offender to serve the prison terms consecutively if the court finds that the consecutive sentence is necessary to protect the public from future crime or to punish the offender and that consecutive sentences are not disproportionate to the seriousness of the offender's conduct and to the danger the offender poses to the public and if the court absolutely finds any of A, B, or C. And for this court, uh, for today's sentencing, uh, would we be under the, the B analysis? Uh, I know this court had the benefit of sitting through the motion to suppress hearing, so you got uh, a little bit of the evidence that the state would produce if the court, uh, if this case did proceed to trial. However, I think it's necessary in terms of lay, leveling a just and appropriate sentence to know exactly what occurred in this case back in October of 2017. Uh, at approximately 8.08 p.m., October 23rd of 2017, Bruce Puskovic and Jeffrey Scullin returned to the home uh, that they shared with Melinda and Anna, and they discovered Melinda's body uh, in the kitchen. Uh, she had suffered numerous stab wounds and gunshot wounds. Uh, almost immediately, the law enforcement agency, Strongsville, Ohio, uh, conducted a thorough investigation trying to solve this crime. I don't know if you're aware of this, but initially, uh, the whole community in the southwest portion of the county, specifically Strongsville, was worried that there was a burglar loose committing homicides. And this was a week before Halloween. So law enforcement went into overdrive trying to quell the concerns of the community that there wasn't this burglar on the loose committing homicides. And I really would like to take this time to commend not only the Strongsville Police Department, uh, but Ohio BCI, the FBI. Uh, they put forth numerous amounts of man hours and effort in order to ensure this case was properly investigated from the time they discovered the death of Melinda Puskovic. Uh, this case, Your Honor, has overwhelming evidence of this defendant's guilt. And I cannot state that clear enough. Overwhelming evidence of this defendant's guilt. Thanks to the efforts of the Strongsville Police Department in doing everything the correct and right way. Melinda, as you'll learn from Bruce, Anna, and Megan, was a Strongsville Middle School teacher beloved in the community, 49 years old. You'll learn from the Strongsville Police Department that early on their attention went towards Mr. Jeffrey Scullin because the stories that Mr. Scullin told the police never added up. It was one lie after another after another. In the days after the homicide, the Strongsville Police Department and Detective Stoltz went to every single person they knew that could confirm any story that Mr. Scullin told, and all of it was false. He wasn't where he was supposed to be, he wasn't where he said he was, and that story continued to unravel. You also heard that Besides this defendant's story being a total fabrication, the Strongsville police were able to locate one of the two murder weapons in this case in this defendant's vehicle. This defendant's vehicle had a knife used to stab Melinda over 35 times, had Melinda's blood on the knife blade, and this defendant's and Melinda's DNA on the knife handle. You also learn from the confession of this defendant when he was interviewed by FBI agent Lance Fragamelli that he told Strongsville police 
This defendant, in his confession, told Strongsville police where to find the second murder weapon. Knowledge only the murderer themselves would know. He directed them to the Buick LeSabre. Inside the Buick LeSabre, they found a backpack that contained the revolver and his sweatpants that he wore the night that he killed Melinda Pleskovic. The revolver was tested. This defendant's DNA was found all over the revolver, and this revolver was ballistically matched to the three more pellets that killed Melinda Pleskovic. His sweatpants had Melinda's blood on them, and his sweatpants had his DNA on the waistband. Furthermore, and this is some evidence you didn't get to hear, but it's important evidence that once again shows the overwhelming guilt of this defendant. That we had the FBI map his cell phone of where it was at during uh, the time period that Melinda was killed on October 23rd of 2017. He gave one story of being about a, at a get-go gas station, when in truth, his cell phone shows him at the house when Melinda returned from the doctors that day and at the house when Melinda was killed. This case, and I'll state it again, has overwhelming evidence of this defendant's guilt. And I say that because one of the factors that I know this court considers is acceptance of our responsibility. And you're about to hear from Bruce, Anna, and Megan. And what I expect you to hear is how important Melinda was, what she meant to them, and this ongoing loss that will never be healed. Um, this is kind of addressed to you. I sent you an email. Um, my point is, Jeffrey Scullin should never be allowed to walk free again. The extent of his monstrous actions has forever crippled the lives of everyone he knows. My mother, Melinda, will never be coming back, and that egotistical boy had absolutely no reason or right to rip her away from us. I say boy and not man, because a man doesn't harm his loved ones. A man owns his actions and decisions without hiding behind lies. A man supports his family and would do anything for his children. Jeff has done none of these things. Because of his heinous crimes, my brother lost the best mother a child with Down syndrome could possibly have. My father lost his best friend and soulmate. My sister and I no longer have our smart, beautiful, and respectable role model mother to guide us. And my daughter, Aurora, lost her cherished Grammy. The worst part is that someday I will have to sit her down and explain this horrifying nightmare to her. I'll have to find a reason as to why her father chose incarceration and lies instead of his baby girl. And to be honest, I have no idea where to even begin. Jeffrey needs to never have the option to inflict this pain on another human being again because he most definitely will kill again. He is a manipulator, a pathological liar, a thief, a sociopath, and above all, a sadistic murderer. He shows no remorse and deserves to spend his days away from the innocent. Sincerely, myself, Melinda's daughter, and his ex-fiance. Hi, um, I'm Megan Pleskovic, M-E-G-A-N-P-L-E-S-K-O-B-I-C. Uh, Your Honor. Our lives will never be the same because of Jeffrey Scullin. My mom was the face of compassion, love, perseverance, and because of him, she is gone. My mom faced countless numbers of setbacks and negative situations, but she always found a way to get through them and do so in a positive and enthusiastic manner. As I got older, she quickly turned into my best friend. We would talk about everything under the sun, and I think one of the hardest parts now 
is not being able to call or hug her after something great or something horrible happens. She taught me to be passionate about things I believe in, to be non-judgmental, and to always stick up for myself and others around me. She was my biggest fan and I grew up being hers. My last collegiate softball game, she drove five hours to support me. And after the game, she was the first person I cried to behind the dugout. She loved all of us kids and her granddaughter with all her heart. As for Jeffrey Scullin, my mom and dad opened their home to him because they're good, loyal people. My mom cared for him as a part of our family and bent over backwards for him, yet he took her life in one of the most violent ways imaginable. I want him to feel the terror and pain that my mom must have experienced, but because of his lack of remorse and sick, twisted mind, I don't think he ever will. Nor do I think he cares about the grief and pain that his own family, his daughter, or the rest of us feel. He is a selfish, sadistic monster that deserves to never again see the light of day. He manipulated my entire family into thinking he could be trusted, all while he stole from us and plotted the unthinkable. He took away my dad's wife, my siblings and my mom, and his daughter's Grammy. He took away a life that gave nothing but goodness for reasons that we will probably never know. No punishment will ever bring back the incredible human being that my mom was, but knowing that Jeffrey Scullin will spend the rest of his pathetic life in prison would bring relief to all of us. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. <clears throat> I'm Bruce Pluskovic, B-R-U-C-E-P-L-E-S-K-O-V-I-C. Uh, in January of 2017, on Melinda's birthday, we were all sitting in the family room and Anna and Jeff had an announcement that we would be grandparents. <clears throat> it was a bit of a shock and we were taken by surprise, but we were all so excited about the arrival of our first granddaughter. We wanted to help Jeff and Anna out as best as we could, so we offered to let them live in the basement so they could work and save up money for the next year or so. We allowed them to live rent free and help with raising the baby as well since we had experience raising three of our own. This would help them in the transition when they got married and moved out on their own. <coughs> we had a loving, caring, and normal household and we took Jeff in as one of our own. Later in the year we had three instances where money would go missing, then it was car keys going missing, then the reported burglaries that we learned after the fact to be untrue. We never had an instance around the house or in our neighborhood at this level, and Melinda even did a couple of Facebook posts wondering what was going on and how worried she was. Personally, I was trying to figure out a solution to what was going on and was physically and mentally wearing down with the stress of a job loss, ensuing job loss that was, we knew was coming after while these incidents were happening. The loss of Melinda will have a rippling effect on the kids and I forever. Kyle is confused as to why his mom is not around and has become more attached to me. Every time we go out to eat, he spends a lot of time looking out the window to see if his mother is going to show up. <coughs> My daughters are heartbroken by the loss of their mother, who can never be replaced. Aurora loved Melinda right away, and Grammy was her favorite. Melinda was a natural with kids, just like at her job teaching. Melinda and I had a game plan to downsize and live a, live a little simpler life as the two of us headed towards the next chapter of lives, towards retirement. That dream has been taken away and replaced by nightmares, a lack of sleep, and having to live life at hyperspeed just to work on a never-ending to-do list. <clears throat> Over the past year, it has been very therapeutic for me to keep up with our many circles of friends as much as possible. It has helped with the emptiness, loneliness, depression, and the hurt with the loss of milk. I can sense the pain, shock, and anger on all their faces when I see them, but when we get together, we make the best of it, have fun rehashing the memories and stories of her. Now that I've seen the interviews with the detectives and the overwhelming evidence, just continuation of maintaining his innocence doesn't allow our family to heal and receive closure. He never provided a reason why or accepted responsibilities for his actions leading up to the night of Melinda's horrific murder. Jeff also seems to portray himself as a victim in all this when he's the one who has caused all the pain and suffering. I find it really insulting. The the week after Melinda was killed, through his time of arrest, he calmly carried on as if nothing of significance seemed to have happened. He even wanted us to put apps on our cell phones so he knew where we all were. I find that a bit scary. I'm aware of a couple situations in his past involving him in firearms. Between these situations and Melinda's seemingly planned murder, I truly believe Jeff would kill again and ruin innocent people's lives like ours. 
I'm asking the court for justice and a verdict that reflects the unending pain and suffering he has caused my family and all the people who knew and loved her dearly. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Stoltz would like to address the court for the Strongsville Police Department. Thank you. Good morning, Detective. Good morning, Your Honor. Jeffrey Scullin's murder of Melinda Pleskovic is arguably the most heinous crime in the history of the city of Strongsville. Jeff shot Melinda three times. He fired a four shot that missed her. He stabbed her 36 or 37 times. He murdered Melinda in her own home, the same home Bruce and she welcomed him into two years prior. He murdered Melinda while her mentally handicapped son and his 15 month old daughter, her granddaughter were home. And then he had the audacity to leave her son home alone with her for several hours while she lied dead on the kitchen floor. That level of cruelty is impossible to understand. I spent a considerable amount of time with Jeff between October 23rd and November 1st of last year. While we're still on scene, the other officers and I, we were surprised by how strangely calm he was. I interviewed him later that night at the police department and again, I was surprised by how calm and seemingly unaffected he was by Melinda's death. We spoke at length that night. I found it telling that he never asked about Melinda, not even once, not how she was doing, or even if she was dead or alive. I interviewed Jeff three more times after that night. Not to be troubled with the concept of honesty, Jeff filled much of those interviews with blatant and outrageous lies about fabricated burglaries and his whereabouts and actions on the day he murdered Melinda. Most disappointing though, was how unremorseful and unapologetic he was, even after resenting with a mountain of evidence that completely dispelled all of his lies and unquestionably proved he murdered Melinda. The Plessworth family lived peacefully in their home without fear for nearly 20 years prior to Jeff moving in. He tormented them for months before murdering her. He stole from them, randomly set off car alarms, fabricated burglaries, caused them to believe that they were being targeted and making them feel unsafe in their own home. And it's no coincidence that the thefts, the car alarms, reports of burglaries have completely stopped once Jeff was no longer in the home. Melinda was only 49 years old when Jeff took her life. She was a beloved middle school teacher, a popular fixture in the soccer community, and most of all, she was a loving and devoted mother and grandmother. Her death was senseless. Compounding that, Jack's, Jeff's lack of remorse and unwillingness to simply tell Melinda's family that he's sorry has only perpetuated their pain and suffering they deserve that apology, but sadly, Jeff has remained unwilling to reciprocate the same warmth and kindness that they showed him when they welcomed him into their home. On behalf of Melinda's family in the city of Strongsville, I respectfully ask the court to consider the brutal nature of this crime, the utter lack of accountability and remorse shown from Jeff, and the subsequent pain and suffering Melinda's family has endured and will forever more when imposing a sentence today. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Sullivan, would you please? The court has considered the record, the oral statements made here today, and the pre-sentence investigation report, and the 51 victim impact statements that the court received. The court has considered the purposes and principles of sentencing under revised code section 2929.11, and the seriousness and recidivism factors relevant to the offenses and offender pursuant to revised code section 2929.12, and the need for deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, and restitution. 
The victim, Melinda Pleskovic, just 49 years old, was savagely murdered by you, Mr. Sullivan, in the kitchen of her home, which she had generously made your home. You shot her three times and stabbed her a minimum of 35 times. You did so while her son, Kyle, who has Down syndrome, must have been or was in the home. You did so with your own daughter and her granddaughter, Aurora, close by. Then you had the audacity to sit down for dinner with her husband, Bruce, at Applebee's where their daughter, Anna, worked. Then you returned to the scene of your vicious crime and allowed Bruce to go into the home that he shared with his wife and children and find his wife on the kitchen floor in a pool of blood. You served as a pall bearer at Melinda Pleskovic's funeral, knowing that you were the person responsible for inflicting upon her loved ones and many friends all of the pain, shock, sorrow and heartache they were experiencing and continue to experience a year after you murdered her. Melinda, or Mel, as she was known to many, was the beloved wife, wife of Bruce, mother to three children, Megan, Anna, and Kyle, and the grandmother of your own daughter, Aurora. She was a teacher for 27 years, and a family member, colleague, friend, and matriarch or mom of what I understand was an extended uh, soccer family. I did receive 51 impact, victim impact statements to include those from her husband, her two daughters, sister, brother, nephew, great nephew, mother-in-law, brother-in-laws, nieces, her second parents as they were known, colleagues, friends, soccer friends, and students and students' parents. I read each and every one of those letters and the words used to describe Mel include, and I've taken these directly from those letters, awesome teacher, amazing friend, the rock that held her family together, very special, fun, selfless, beautiful with a caring spirit, an inspiration to others, smiling and welcoming, a natural with kids, the most inclusive person, always welcoming, a coach, a role model, had an infectious laugh, patient, a mentor, a great teammate, the go-to person, truly amazing, passionate, a motivator, supportive. She opened her home to others. She was warm-hearted. She was a take-charge kind of person. She deeply cared about others. She was always prepared, never afraid to set you straight, the heart of her family, a shining light, best friend, sounding board, and caretaker. There is no doubt that Mel's family and friends miss her terribly, and they continue to suffer each day because of your highness actions. They do not understand how you could have killed this wonderful woman who opened her home to you and helped you. As you said, she was like a mother to you, and your relationship with her facilitated the offense. So, with regard to the seriousness factors under 2929.12b, there is no more serious offense than what you can, uh, committed upon what has only been described as a wonderful wife, mother, friend, colleague. The second factor, more serious, is your relationship with her, living in her home, treated like a son, facilitated the offense. There is nothing that indicates your conduct is in fact less serious. 
Now, as far as factors indicating whether recidivism is more or less likely, the only factor indicating that recidivism is less likely is that you do not have any prior criminal convictions. For legal reasons, you pled no contest. Of course, that's hurt the family because there's no true acknowledgement or remorse that you've displayed at this point in time. But again, I understand that you have legal rights and are reserving those rights. So I'm not, I cannot, by law, technically hold that against you at this juncture. But again, based upon the letters that I've read, you've not shown any remorse to anyone throughout this process. And again, as explained to me in those letters, uh, Mel's family and friends who had the opportunity to speak with you and watch you in the days following her murder to include at her funeral find your actions and attitude after you murdered her to be incomprehensible and abhorrent. And what I think so tragic is that Mel's son Kyle does not understand where she is and continues to look for his mom every day. That is so sad. And you did that. Therefore, on the aggravated murder count, count one that you pled guilty to, the court imposes a sentence of life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 30 years. The three-year firearm specification or the three years for that firearm specification must be served prior to and consecutive to uh, that term, meaning that you will not be eligible for parole until you have served 33 years. With regard to count five, tampering with evidence, that's the felony of the third degree. The court is imposing a prison term of 36 months on that count. With regard to count six, making false alarms in the misdemeanor of the first degree, the court is imposing a period of local incarceration of 180 days. And with regard to count seven, endangering children, again, a misdemeanor of the first degree, the court's imposing a period of local incarceration of 180 days. Now, those two misdemeanor offenses, the time imposed there must be served concurrent with the time imposed on the aggravated murder. And with regard to the tampering with evidence, uh, with, uh, the court is imposing that concurrently as well. I know the states offered a basis uh, for the court to impose consecutive time, but I'm not sure that, um, I think the only possible basis would be under section B, and I'm not sure that that would, uh, th the circumstances surrounding this particular case would warrant consecutive time based upon that portion of the statute, because there are separate findings, as the state pointed out, that I must find, and I think it would be difficult to find that one of those required sections actually applies. So, now, with regard to count five, though, the tampering with evidence, as part of your sentence, you are subject to plan your release from prison to a period of post-release control to be supervised by the adult parole authority. This would be optional on the part of the adult parole authority and could be for up to three years. If you would fail to meet the terms and conditions of any post-release control supervision imposed on you for count five, then the adult parole authority could modify and or extend your supervision and make it more restrictive, incarcerate you for up to one half of the original sentence imposed by the court, charge you with a new offense called escape, another felony where you would face additional prison time, and if you commit a new crime while on post-release control, you can face the maximum penalties under the law for the new crime committed. Um, there's no restitution uh, that was part of the plea or that's been documented or demonstrated. I'm not imposing a fine. I am ordering that you pay court costs and credit will be granted for all days spent in custody in this case prior to sentencing together with all future custody days while the defendant awaits transportation. 363 days. You'll be getting credit for 363 days. Uh, is there anything further on behalf of the state? Nothing on behalf of the state. Anything further on behalf of the defendant? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Appellate rights? If the court wishes. You wanted me to read those to him previously, correct? At the time of the plea? Certainly. All right. Do you understand, Mr. Scullin, that you have the right to an appeal on this matter within 30 days after the filing of the court sentencing entry? Yes. And do you understand that if you are unable to pay for the cost of the transcript, the record, and all relevant documents required for the appeal, that they would be provided without cost to you? Yes. 
and you understand that if you are unable to pay for an appeal, you are entitled to have a notice of appeal filed without the payment of a filing fee. Yes. And you understand that if you are unable to obtain counsel for an appeal, counsel will be appointed for you at no cost. Yes. All right. Anything further, Mr. Gattitus? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. The defendant is remanded.